So I would like to slowly start up and welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Gabor Holsch and uh, I am uh, going to be the speaker this evening in China and this afternoon, if you call in from Europe, I saw a couple of registrations from there. So I am a Shanghai based uh, management consultant, former diplomat. I specialize in intercultural leadership and, and history is one of my hobbies. And in that capacity, I run the history club of the Royal Asiatic Society, China, Shanghai uh, branch. So uh, I am the one who is usually in charge of both physical and online events related to history. I think most of you need no detailed introduction into the Royal Asiatic Society and the Royal Asiatic Society China, because I can see that most of you are members, but if you want to be a, a member, you can be a member whether or not you're in China. Quite a few of our events are online and um, you can keep in touch with us. You can keep track of the events. You can, you can join us quite often on Zoom. I would like to, um, to bring to you this, this story for a couple of reasons. So first of all is the gentleman on the right, Ignatius Trebich Lincoln. He has been a bit of an obsession of mine for a while. And at the end, I will tell you how most of the Hungarians, of which I am one, get connected to Trebich's story for the first time. There was, there was an extremely popular paperback writer in Hungary who made Trebich Lincoln one of his characters. Uh, the other one is obviously uh, the origin. He was also born in Hungary. And uh, thirdly, it is the East-West connection. So. Um, when I was a student at the Diplomatic Academy of Vienna, I was quite surprised to find out in one of the archives that he spent some time, actually, he, he, he spent uh, two decades in Shanghai. And uh, when I came to Shanghai, I kept researching about uh, the story. And the interesting thing is probably many of you have experienced this, is as time moves forward, tremendous amount of information gets online every single day. And it makes uh, amateur historical research more and more fascinating every single day. And then as I researched about Trebich Lincoln's life, then I ran into Josef Meisinger. And uh, I think many of you know him for from another angle, perhaps uh, you researched about the Third Reich in Asia or the um, uh, collaboration between uh, the Japanese occupiers in Shanghai and uh, the Nazi government, the Nazi party. So um, if uh, you were interested in this angle that you might have run into this man as well. But I think that the two of them had anything to do with each other is nothing less than absolutely fascinating. So here we are with the stories. I'm holding in my hand right now our, our journal from last year. And actually inside of this journal, apart from lots of other things, you are going to find my essay, which is uh, called uh, Alone and Surrounded, which is, which is an essay focusing on Trebich Lincoln himself, not so much on uh, the double story that I'm presenting here. And if you are a member, and if you haven't picked up your copy yet, then please, uh, give us a push and we will send you a copy. If you're not a member, I think basically it is uh, a reason to sign up for membership to receive this. And some of the people who are on the call today are also featured in this uh, uh, journal with their articles. Uh, if you're interested in more details of the topic, then please check out the article. And also I'm going to recommend a couple of other sources. What you can see here in the picture is uh, out of the butcher and the monk, this is the monk. This is the gentleman who called himself Chao Kung, whereas in reality, he was uh, born in Poksh, which is a, a lovely town by the river Danube in Hungary. He was born in 1879 to a family which was quite rich from basically shipping, as it would call it, logistics, as, it, as we would call it today. But uh, where... Ignatius or Ignatz in Hungarian would end up during his quite uh, unbelievable life, it, it would have been never guessed in this family. So his father wanted him to be a rabbi, which he, which he uh, didn't have the patience to because 
uh, maybe some of you know that in order to uh, follow that spiritual vocation, you have to be quite patient in learning the classics, which is something that uh, Ignatius Trebich Lincoln or uh, Trebich Ignatz at that point didn't have the, the patience to do. He, he was a strange character. It was, it was a very respectable family. And um, he was basically the black sheep of that family. He wanted to become an actor. He signed up to, to study acting, but he didn't have the patience to that either. Then he committed some petty crimes. He had some problems with the police, um, went to uh, the United Kingdom, uh, allegedly to be uh, present at uh, Queen Victoria's uh, Jubilee in 1897, but practically he was running away from the law from Hungary. He had a very interesting life, um, which was characterized by finding very influential people, influencing them quite unscrupulously until they gave him the access to, to funds, to high society and visibility that he usually abused. So as I say in the article, uh, both Meisinger and Trebich was actually the master of being at the right time, at the right place and doing the wrong thing. But what happens in Trebich's life is it's a big up and down. So every time he, he finds something interesting, he becomes quite successful in the short run, but then he manages somehow to make um, increasingly disastrous mistakes. What you can see on the left side from 1910 is a, a comic from Punch magazine, which pictures him as a member of parliament. So what happened to him is that he, he ended up in England. Uh, he became, he, he looked for all kinds of lowly secretary positions and um, Eventually, he became the, uh, the secretary, the private secretary, secretary of a food magnet um, in England at the time, who was writing a book about agricultural policies in continental Europe. So he became a researcher for this project. And when the book was published, this person um, by the name of uh, Seymour Rantry was so impressed with him that he actually managed to make him member of the British Parliament on, uh, on behalf of um, one of the smaller liberal parties. However, his um, uh, stint in the British Parliament didn't last long because within a year, the government that supported him collapsed. However, this gave him the rank of former member of parliament in, uh, in Britain. So that opened a couple of doors for him. And then very shortly, uh, he found himself actually um, uh, uh, arrested a couple of times. And um, this is also a recurring theme in his life that I can, I can fill up the details if you want a little bit later, but I'm trying to get to China as, as fast as I can. So after his um, mostly failed uh, time in the British Parliament, he went over to the continent and tried to be an entrepreneur, which he failed in. But eventually he ended up in Germany and he was in Germany in 1920 at the time of the so-called Cup Putsch. Now, uh, this again resulted in a very short-lived Republic which um, uh, collapsed in a couple of months in Germany. And he was the chief censor of this Republic. So the picture that we can see there from 1920 is from his time as a chief censor which is quite important from the perspective of our story in China, because this is during the Cup Putsch, this is where Trebich Lincoln met most of the characters who would later end up in the Nazi party um, about 10 years later, and would reappear in Shanghai as advisors to the Chiang Kai-shek government and later on behalf of the Nazi party that had uh, diplomatic uh, relations with the occupying Japanese, and also had certain ambitions in the Asia Pacific. Now, after the Cup Putsch, uh, basically the Cup Putsch itself failed. Trebich Lincoln uh, tries to somehow leverage the excess that he gained, but he didn't manage to do that again. He got into trouble. He spent uh, some time running from the law under all kinds of fake identities. And eventually where there is literally nowhere to go in the West, 
he decides to go to China, mainly because um, the jurisdiction of the law enforcement that he was running away from couldn't catch him there. So again, he starts a very interesting cycle of uh, quick success and then quick failure. And some of you may have heard of the warlord in central China called Wu Pei Fu. Somehow he ends up in, uh, the, uh, in the outer circles of the Wu Pei Fu government or the uh, Wu Pei Fu warlordship. And um, uh, less than a year after he left Europe, he returns to Europe at the head of a Chinese military delegation that was trying to get investment from, for exploiting natural resources, mainly timber, in uh, the central Chinese regions under uh, Wu Pei Fu's uh, lordship. He was not well received. I mean, you can imagine that at this time, uh, both law enforcement and uh, secret services already know about him. They know that he was a member of parliament. They know his uh, role in the cup, which they also know about some of his uh, failed businesses that ended up in financial mismanagement. So obviously being at the head of this um, Chinese military delegation didn't help him too much. Actually so much so that they didn't even grant him a visa to a number of European countries where this military delegation visited, including his own native Hungary. So um, after a couple of uh, trials of trying to get back in power this way, he finally allegedly goes through a, um, a spiritual conversion um, to Buddhism. He um, um, decides that he discards his past, his Western life. He joins a uh, Buddhist movement. I wouldn't call it order, but basically a, um, a Buddhist movement that was quite popular among foreigners in major Chinese cities, mainly Tianjin and Shanghai. And he joins the order that you can see in the, in the central picture. Their center was somewhere in the Jing'an area. And he starts actually not only um, did he get initiated as a Buddhist monk by this um, somewhat questionable Buddhist order, but also he starts his own monastery with about a dozen international converts. The interesting thing about it is that in addition to a spiritual undertaking, this is also a financial undertaking because um, people, including the ones you can see in the picture who joined his order, they had to give up their earthly uh, possessions and they had to donate their money to the, um, uh, to the order. So already in the, uh, the mid 1930s, we can, we can find uh, so-called Chao Kung, um, failed parliamentary, uh, failed business person, failed putschist in Germany and failed at a couple of other, uh, other uh, things as a kind of self-appointed Buddhist guru, quite interested in global affairs. One thing that you have to know about him is that he was terribly upset at um, not only his failed parliamentary career in, the, in, in Great Britain, but also that subsequently because of some of the financial mismanagement uh, that he committed, Actually, he even spent a couple of years in prison during the First World War in Britain. So at that time, he said to himself and he wrote in his memoirs that uh, he basically uh, pledged revenge on the British Empire. And this is going to be quite important for the uh, remaining story that I'm going to, uh, to show you. By the mid uh, 30s, however, if you follow the articles that he wrote, the two autobiographies, and also if you look at uh, the, um, all the articles that were written about him by eyewitnesses and by secret services, it, it's, it's becoming increasingly clear that I think he is um, suffering of something of a mental breakdown. Uh, the lack of attention basically drives him crazy. And he starts bombarding newspapers, some of which actually publish his declarations of one crazy thing after another, out of which my, uh, my favorite one is uh, 
actually, I'm going to show you in the next slide. Uh, I would I would still like to uh, tell you a little bit about the newspaper article on the right side. So as he was Hungarian and as he kept turning up uh, next to quite prominent historical figures, uh, newspapers in Hungary, they followed him quite closely. And whereas um, Trebic's own story was outlandish enough, but due to the scarce information that the Hungarian press had about his story, it was always somehow inflated to the point, for example, um, when um, at one point a Hungarian newspaper seemed to know that Trebic Lincoln is going to be the next emperor of China, something that obviously never happened. Let's look briefly at Josef Meisinger before I connect the story and I will tell you a little bit more about uh, the political ambitions of Trebic Lincoln. So as I said, what I can, what I can see uh, in the shared history of these two people is that both of them had stellar ambitions. Uh, both of them were at the right place at the right time. Both of them did the spectacularly wrong thing. Both of them were associated with um, uh, very powerful people. And both of them actually managed to influence those powerful for people so that they are trusted and they are assigned to quite important positions. So um, Josef Meisinger, however, was uh, different from Trebich Lincoln in one very important sense is that although Trebich Lincoln was unscrupulous, aimless, and ultimately failed, but people who knew him, they agreed that he had very high intelligence and he had extremely good communication skills, which cannot be said about Josef Meisinger. He distinguished himself in the First World War and shortly after the, uh, after the First World War ended, he, he joined the political movement or series of movements that eventually would lead to the Nazi party. So when the Nazi party was formed, he was already in the inner circles of, of that party. He joined the uh, party. He, he joined the SS as soon as the SS was created. And very soon he found himself under the mentorship, under the wings, if you like, um, of uh, both uh, uh, Himmler and his um, inner circles. So he was, he was not an intelligent person. People who knew him saw that he was a bear of a man, as you can see in the picture that was taken at the time of his arrest in, in Japan in 1945. Uh, he was imposing, but he was not smart, and he was, he was pretty gullible. Uh, this is important to remember because, as you will see, they are going to find themselves with Trebich Lincoln in the middle of some very turbulent political struggles. And the leading motive, I think, in Meisinger's life is that when people wanted to get their dirty work done by somebody, they basically pulled Meisinger out of, out of a cupboard, uh, gave him some gut-wrenching assignments, and, uh, and then discarded of him, which is, which is going to happen in our Shanghai saga as well. However, in um, um, around uh, uh, the... Um, uh, when the Third, Third Reich started to have its first successes in uh, Europe and North Africa, they gave Josef Meisinger a, a, a quite, um, in, in today's words, quite um, distasteful task of basically running the vice guard of the Nazi party. So he was responsible for unearthing, for investigating relationships, including homosexual relationships, relationships between Jews and non-Jews. Um, he was responsible for digging into people's pasts, whether there was something related to prostitution, drugs, and so on. And uh, he did this job with such dogged commitment that actually he almost wrecked the party itself. So um, there are a couple of famous cases when he, start, uh, when he, when he found uh, vices not only outside in the general population, but also in the Nazi party itself, in the Wehrmacht, in the SS. And uh, of course, the Nazi party had to expose certain people. And, and this was actually the downfall of quite a few prominent um, Wehrmacht officers, for example. 
the story that is going to be most important for us concerns a, uh, a mistress of Himmler's who was a former prostitute, which was actually found out by, uh, by Meisinger himself. And in order to, to shield his mentor from uh, public disgrace, he actually divorced his wife and married this former mistress of Himmler's, which is going to be the wife that is going to accompany him to Shanghai. So I'm going to sh uh, share with you a little bit more about the Shanghai story in a minute. Um, but what we need to know about him or what we need to know about the background of the story is um, why somebody would be sent to Shanghai from the SS and from the Nazi party in the first place. So um, at the time, Obviously, uh, Germany, as the Third Reich at the time, had proper diplomatic relationships with uh, several East Asian countries, uh, including Japan. But the Third Reich and the Nazi Party uh, specifically didn't really trust the diplomats that represented German interests in East Asia. So they decided to assign a couple of uh, trusted Nazi officers to act as the eyes and ears right. of the party. And uh, <clears throat> Meisinger was chosen for this job, mainly for the reason that simply the party and the SS didn't know what to do with him anymore. They, um, he he uh, became a little bit too much for the aforementioned reasons in Germany. They sent him to Poland, but in Poland, his uh, cruelty in the Jewish ghetto of Warsaw was, was even too much for the time. So actually he was about to be court-martialed for his role, for his methods in um, the Jewish ghetto of Warsaw. And at that point, Himmler decided that they couldn't ex expose themselves to the scandal of court-martialing uh, Meisinger. And the most likely scenario, the most likely version of the story is that at the very beginning of 1941, he was secretly put on a submarine together with his wife and shipped over to Japan. Um, and since his jurisdiction was Japan and China, so this is how we find, find him popping up in, uh, in Shanghai. I'm going to share with you the details of the story in a minute. But this is how we find him in 1945 after the unconditional surrender of Japan in Yokohama, where he gave himself up to the American army. Uh, he was captured, he was interrogated, uh, he was sent to Poland. And in 1947, actually, he was tried in a Polish court and he died in prison. Let's look at the, uh, the um, conspiracy that, two, that these two people tried to put together. Now, the way that uh, they met is, um, is, is, is not known. Um, probably they met at the household or one of the big parties of Albert Mirini, who was uh, a secret agent for several governments, including uh, Italy and Germany. And um, the Mirini Villa was actually a meeting place for all kinds of people, but specifically everybody who was uh, connected to the German diaspora and at this time also uh, the, uh, the German secret service in Shanghai. So what we know is that Trebich Lincoln and uh, Josef Meisinger somehow met in Shanghai and they started plotting the following conspiracy. They wanted to um, spike up popular revolt in favor of the Third Reich in Tibet. Ch um, Germany had its eye on Tibet for a long time because obviously at that time it was mostly under uh, British influence, but it was also the way to China, to India, and uh, uh, for its resources. It was, it was uh, one of the prime targets in the planned far-reaching Asian conquest of the Third Reich. Um, the Panchen Lama, the ninth Panchen Lama, whose picture I'm showing you, uh, he was an obsession of uh, Trebich Lincoln's. He actually never met in person, but followed the, um, 
the court of the Pancha Lama everywhere. And at that time, uh, he spent, I mean, uh, the Pancha Lama uh, spent considerable amount of time in, um, in Beijing, in the Lama Temple, a building which many of you, I think, know. Uh, and then something interesting happened. In 1937, the ninth Panchen Lama died at a time where five years previously, the Dalai Lama had died, which means that the Tibetan uh, Buddhist church or spiritual movement was headless at the moment. So it didn't have an appointed head. You probably know that both the, the, the Dalai Lama and the Panchen Lamas re reincarnate officially. And then they start a search for the reincarnation. Now in those days with bad uh, communication in Tibet, it took much longer to find the reincarnation of the spiritual leader. At which point, uh, Ignatius Trebich Lincoln um, informs the press that he is the reincarnation of both the Dalai and the Panchen Lamas. So when I told you that if we follow his, uh, his, both his autobiographical articles and the articles that were written about him, uh, you can see that he is already not 100% in control of his mental capacities. And this could be one of the, of the signs of that. Now, at the time when he meets uh, Josef Meisinger, he, he is already obsessed with Tibet. And since he has vowed revenge on the British Empire, this neatly fits together in a kind of plot where he would help Germany acquire uh, Tibet for itself. Now, at the same time, um, when he meets um, uh, Josef Meisinger, Meisinger has just became part of a German secret service operation with Theodor Siefkin in the middle picture at the head. So if you have ever heard of the so-called Bureau Siefkin, that is uh, Theodor Siefkin's uh, operation. What happened here is that at that time, uh, telecommunications was in a very primitive state, but German technology was ahead of uh, most of the other countries. And uh, when the war disrupted regular mail, which was mostly taken with train and with ship, then the German government decided to create an advantage to Germany, uh, specifically German businesses and secret services by shipping in telephone can uh, radio equipment into China, which is going to be strong enough to create an entire network of spreading propaganda all over China and also receiving um, broadcasts from secret service agents, not just in China, but even through a planned system down to Southeast Asia. So this is the operation that uh, Theodor Zivkin was put in charge of. The problem was that now we had three layers of um, intelligence work. One of them was, a, um, uh, was the regular consular network, the second one was Bureau Sivkin and the people, the secret agents around him. And the third one was the SS who sent a couple of officers to supervise that all of this is done according to the uh, political and moral code of the Third Reich. And these three layers completely mistrusted one another. So much so that eventually Theodor Sivkin was replaced and um, um, in his place, the um, person who is mostly known as Ludwig Erhard, but actually you can see his, his original name here. So he, he was ev uh, eventually replaced and not in any way, but using uh, Meisinger as a, how do you say, as a stooge basically. So um, originally what happened is that the uh, consular network was only supposed to transfer messages from Bureau Siefkin to Berlin. Um, but they didn't understand the messages that they were supposed to transfer because they were encrypted. Now, knowing that Theodor Siefkin, Siefkin uh, and uh, his people were connected to the military intelligence and knowing that Meisinger and other Nazi officers um, were following everything that happened in the, in the Bureau uh, Sivkin, 
the consular network in Germany and um, the, the consul general of Germany at the time called Fischer, they were extremely worried that actually the encrypted messages that they are transferring to Germany were among others about them. So basically they were uh, secret service reports uh, debating whether they are loyal to the Third Reich or not. So there was a serious disruption of this entire operation. And this is the operation that Meisinger and, and Trebich Lincoln tried to use in order to realize their Tibet plot. So the way they imagined it is uh, they would get this communication equipment into Bureau Zivkin. They would, with the leadership of Meisinger and Trebich Lincoln, they would get their hands on some of this equipment, struggle, uh, smuggle it into Tibet, and using this radio equipment, they would spread German propaganda in Tibet, which would create a popular revolt in favor of Germany. So the, 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 the plan was absolutely crazy to start with. If for no other reasons, because um, neither Meisinger nor Trebich spoke either Chinese or Tibetan, so it is, it is really unknown how they imagined this whole thing. Obviously, um, Trebich Lincoln claimed to, to have powers to lead a Buddhist revolution in Tibet, but in, in fact, what he had was 10 to 12 foreign converts in Shanghai. And there were lots of other um, holes in this plot as well. Now, what you have to know about this, and this is, this is I think, the most entertaining uh, part of the story, is that they constantly bombarded Adolf Hitler's headquarters with their plan. And um, you have to imagine that Josef Meisinger is part of the, um, the Nazi operation that supervises both, both the uh, Bureau Sivkin and the Consul General. They come up with this half-baked plan about Tibet, and then they present it to the Secret Service operations and the diplomatic corps to be transferred to Berlin. But the people, um, Consul General Fischer and, and um, both Zivkin and Erhard themselves, they were fully aware that these people are absolutely not to be trusted. They cannot do what they, they want to do, but also they were afraid to refuse to transfer these messages because they were afraid of both Hitler, what would happen if uh, for some reason he's interested in this plot, and they were terrified by Meisinger, who, who would easily be able to uh, take a quite bloody revenge if he found out that his message was not transferred. So finally, the Consul General of Germany, he decided to um, transfer Meisinger's letter to Hitler's headquarters, but kind of footnoted that in their idea, the meeting between Meisinger Trebich Lincoln, who went by the uh, Buddhist abbot name of Chao Kung, and Hitler is not a good idea. And we can understand why they judged this way, because the letter said the following. Um, here is, said Meisinger in his letter, here is this Buddhist abbot Chao Kung, who has uh, learned Tibetan magic powers while he was studying for his initiations. And uh, he can use both black magic and popular revolt to um, create a popular movement in Tibet in, on behalf of Germany. When, uh, if Hitler ag agrees to the, um, to the meeting, then the moment that Chao Kung steps into the Führer's office, three Tibetan magicians will materialize from the wall through black magic and thus proving to Hitler that uh, Chao Kung indeed has the magic powers that he claims. So this is where we are in the story when this um, dispatch, it was actually a telegram, was sent to Hitler's office. The telegram actually never reached uh, Hitler and there was a very good reason for that. By that time, um, Joachim von Ribbentrop, uh, who was effectively the foreign minister of the Third Reich at that time, already got <clears throat> completely fed up with the, um, um, the conflicts and the confusion between the different secret service agents of Germany in China. 
and actually through a quite clever political plot, plot managed to undermine Heydrich, who was one of Meisinger's mentors. And at the time when um, Meisinger and Trebich Lincoln were plotting their plan, basically the SS and, uh, <clears throat> and the party officials had already lost the power struggle between the diplomatic corps and the military, military intelligence and SS corps in Shanghai. Not only that, but roughly the same time when the dispatch was made to Berlin, although unknown to the people who sent uh, the uh, telegram from Shanghai to Berlin, Rudolf Hess, who was one of the closest uh, allies and chief top officers of Adolf Hitler, actually <clears throat> escaped from Germany in a self-piloted plane and crash landed it in Scotland. Now, um, Rudolf Hess was one of the keys to Adolf Hitler's interest in black magic. So this was the reason why Meisinger and uh, Chao Kung, um, Trebich Lincoln thought that Hitler would even be interested in meeting them and uh, looking at the, the black magic presentation of uh, Buddhist abbot Chao Kung. However, um, as Rudolf has escaped, and it reached Hitler's ears that when um, British Secret Service agents searched the plane of Rudolf Hess, they found lots of different, uh, well, you could, you could call them charms. So all kinds of things that came from the Far East, including vials of holy water from Tibet. So when Hitler heard of this, he gave a very strict order to his officers that he never wants to hear about either oriental magic or any of it um, anymore. So even if the telegram had reached um, Hitler's headquarters at that time, he wouldn't have been interested in the plot anymore. So literally, uh, Josef Meisinger and Abba Chao Kung, alias uh, Trebich Lincoln plot, fell apart from lots of different angles. Now, what happens to them afterwards? As I showed you, um, uh, Josef Meisinger, basically, he, he had a couple of other failed ideas uh, regarding Shanghai. I mean, you have to imagine that here is a Nazi officer. He used to be the vice guard of the Nazi party. He's living in a city which is basically at that point uh, run by Asians, which uh, he had no lost love for. Jews and Russians. So he, he felt there was an awful lot to do there for somebody like himself. He kept bombarding the Japanese occupying government with ideas such as turning Chomming Island, which many of you know, into a concentration camp for political and, and racial prisoners and lots of other ideas. But eventually everybody got fed up with him. Uh, basically, they created a new organizational structure when he was uh, supposed to report directly to the, um, the uh, Japanese army that was occupying Shanghai at the time. And basically he was sidelined. He, he lingered around in different Asian cities until he was arrested in Yokohama. As for Trebich Lincoln himself, um, in 1943, he died after, under mysterious circumstances. At the time, he already told all of his friends that the various secret services that he had worked for during his life, I didn't have time to tell you all that story, but at one point or another, he worked for the British, the American, um, the German, and according to um, uh, his uh, uh, memoirs, although this is questionable, the Japanese secret service as well. So he uh, claimed that they want to poison him. And then finally, in 1943, he died of food poisoning in the Jewish ghetto of Shanghai, which um, at the time it was, it was declared, officially it was declared food poisoning. But of course, there is no shortage of people who think that he was actually poisoned by one of those secret services. So quite a rough story, which didn't end with the death of the people in question. So even today, there are, there are a lot of people who are um, researching the Nazi past of, uh, of Shanghai, of China and the Far East. I just lined up a couple of examples. Actually, if you, um, if you Google Trebich Lincoln and book, you are going to come up with one extremely good volume by uh, an author called Bernard Wasserstein, who also 
helped my research. And uh, if uh, one day Shanghai opens up again, then he will visit Shanghai and hopefully talk to our history club in person. I clipped out uh, that Shanghai Magazine article, which is basically a crash course in uh, Nazi officers in Shanghai. It's quite interesting, not always accurate, but it's it's very good storytelling and it's uh, it's a, it's a nice collection of the people on whom maybe you want to do a little bit more research. You can go online and you can find amazing old articles. So what is happening now is they digitalize basically all the newspapers in the world. I have found, for example, uh, the, the, the newspaper of Appledore, which is um, uh, one of the places where Trebich Lincoln actually lived. And I, I found digitalized articles from 1910 on uh, how local journalists saw uh, Trebich Lincoln. And finally, and this is actually one of my ever favorite sources, but certainly my favorite source for, for this talk and the article that it's based on is that uh, the Central Intelligence Agency uploads entire libraries, entire archives of their predecessor organizations, like the, the Military Intelligence Agency, the American uh, Intelligence Agency, and so on. They don't do anything. They just take a pile of documents. They chuck it into a scanner. They put it online, and researchers like myself, or maybe like you as well, you can do whatever you want with it. Uh, it is, as you can see, there are there are handwritten notes, there are crossouts, there are stamps. If you have the patience, it's an absolute goldmine of life stories. And for example, many of the people uh, I mentioned in uh, in this talk, you can see pages and pages of information, including like uh, transcribed uh, uh, witness statements and and uh, informer statements and so on. Absolutely fascinating. This is where I would like to take you at the moment. And um, I very much hope that uh, you, it was interesting enough for you to, to ask a couple of questions. Uh, I don't know, Alan, you seem to be, according to the icon, you seem to be All right. muted. Sorry, thank you. That better not? Yes. Thank you. That was a fascinating rabbit hole you've let us down. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Can I ask, did you come across at all in your research and anything that led to the Nazis arriving in Shanghai? But it's always been a puzzle to me that <clears throat> Hitler made the, the mistake of taking on uh, America. Well, he was also taking on Russia. And I'm wondering whether there was anything you came across that, that sheds any light on that, any, any absurd detail that would be amusing to know. Specifically on, on what? Why, why the Nazis were in Shanghai or? Well, why, yes, why uh, after the America declared war on Japan, Hitler felt bound by his treaty to, su to support Japan. He'd never kept a treaty promised in his life before. And I'm just wondering whether there was anything, why, why he did that, because obviously it was fatal. Yes, now, uh, one thing that I mentioned in half a sentence, but. But, but then didn't manage to elaborate, is that a lot of people who started off as putschists in the 1920s, um, they ended up in the Nazi party as quite senior officers. And then actually we can find them as advisors to various warlords and eventually Chiang Kai-shek in China. So we know that there were plans, but, but at least I am not quite aware what the plans were. If I had to bet my money on anything, it sounds to me that the Third Reich actually didn't have plans for major military operations in, uh, in, in China. But what they were hoping to do is to build a system with the occupying Japanese, um, the, the occupying Japanese forces and eventually government, because uh, at that time, uh, the Japanese occupying forces were China's de facto government in order to somehow extend the Third Reich's influence. And obviously it was always about resources. So that's why uh, all these um, advisors, some military, some not, were already in China. And that's why the Nazi party basically decided that uh, the, uh, the foreign policy of the Third Reich cannot be left to the diplomats because they were, they were politically not trustworthy enough from the, from the uh, party's perspective. And this is why they built up this SS apparatus, headquartered in Tokyo, actually, 
but, but also responsible for major Chinese cities in order to make sure that everything goes according to plan. So um, I, I actually don't really know, number one, uh, how strong the commitment of the Third Reich was to support Japan. And also, I, I happen to know that the commitment of Japan to work together with the Third Reich was quite low. So if you know about wow. things like the so-called Fugu Plan, where actually uh, the Japanese government was, ac was actively rescuing Eastern European and, and uh, Jewish people from um, uh, territories occupied by the Third Reich, quite, quite contrary to the, to, the, to the Third Reich's vision, um, and, and quite a few others as well, that we know that at the beginning, uh, Japan was very proud and very glad to be allied with Nazi Germany, but the more they learned about the methodologies used there, the, the, the more cautious they became with that alliance. Thank you, fascinating. Thank you very much. 